Hello everyone, this is Kathleen Tarani with Autism Brainstorm, www.autismbrainstorm.org. And today we have Dina Gasner, and Dina is going to be doing a wonderful presentation on the DSM-5, um, considering the DSM-5, and she's basically revisiting um, some of the changes and uh, helping us to understand what that means to the community. Hi Dina, thank you so much for being here. No problem, slide. Um, well, welcome so much to this conversation about the DSM-5. Let me just begin by saying that, um, you know, nobody knows where we're going with this, uh, but I do believe there's a lot of misinformation out there about the DSM-5 dropping Asperger's um, and uh, a lot of information out there that people are going to be denied services because of this. I do think there are some challenges and um, it's going to be a difficult transition. Uh, but um, I can tell you what I've learned so far out of my edition of the DSM-5 and what I've learned from my colleagues and um, hopefully it'll shed some light even though we're all kind of flying blind here. So um, Kathleen, if you can slide. Mm -hmm. Keep going. So it isn't Fifty Shades, it's the DSM-5 that we're talking about today. Slide. And um, what we want to talk about is really this transition. Um, and it's really important because in the prior DSM-4, um, and if you look at the websites of various autism organizations, you can see that we perceived of autism as a lack of something. Know this, know this, slide. Um, lack of that. Um, and in reality, there are many people uh, on the autism spectrum who have too much of everything and not too little. And I think you'll see in the new DSM-5 how there's been an enhancement or an improvement to that. Slide. In the uh, old DSM-4, you know, w what we were seeing is that a lot of kids were being misdiagnosed with a part of autism. You know, I think of Asperger's as this melting pot of diagnoses of different kinds of issues that when you put them all together in the pot, if you will, um, it becomes a syndrome or it becomes a condition. And so it's always been my theory that any of the issues associated with autism could freestand on its own. Uh, but when you put it all together in this particular one human being, we call it Asperger's syndrome. Slide. Keep going. So the DSM-4, um, that's kind of my commentary about what I thought about the four diagnostically. It wasn't very uh, Asperger friendly to begin with. Slide even though it was supposed to be. Um, so if you look at the DSM-5 uh, versus the reality, it said that there was no communication problems. And if you look, um, boy, they're all there. You know, pragmatic language issues, um, all kinds of problems related to s communication. And then it said there was no delay in adaptive functioning and behavior. And we all kind of laugh at that because we know, in fact, that's not true at all. Slide. Um, Keep going. And, and it said that there were no cognitive challenges, but executive function is nothing but a cognitive challenge. And you can look at the slide and read it for yourself and to see just how many cognitive impairment issues we really do have. We may not have an intellectual disability, but we certainly struggle with cognitive processing and thinking. Next. Um, so, you know, what's, what's the deal with the DSM? Um, I'm going to have to go over to my copy of the slides here. Give me a second because I can't read them. They're too little. Sure. sure. Um, so <clears throat> what are the implications of this new DSM-5? Um, will it – give me a second here. I'm trying to mm -hmm. figure out how to make this happen. Um, will it enhance access to services or will it create further barriers to identification? How will the diagnosticians use this? Well, you know, different people in different diagnostic communities are looking at this very hard. Um, I know for a fact one of my colleagues in the psychology uh, field is saying that they're probably going to move over to the ICD-10 or 11. Um, and that's a topic for another day, but, you know, what is it going to mean? Um, Everybody's concerned about will they or their child have to be reevaluated. Well, we'll talk about that later, but there's a grandfather clause that will keep that from having, happening. Um, <clears throat> what will happen to my current services? 
it again is going to depend on one key part which we're going to discuss today which is called the severities page and I think you'll be able to see why that makes me a little nervous around the edges um, and what happens to my identity if I'm currently I di diagnosed with Asperger syndrome well I think that the term Aspie is going to be around a long time um, I, I always have thought of autism as being an internal expression of it which would be more in the Asperger's realm or more externalized or obvious or more evident to diagnosticians which would be more in the autism side um, we found that this high functioning and low functioning language isn't productive for anyone so it's uncertain how that's going to happen but I think as identities are going we are a community and we always will be a community next slide so now we're going to actually go through the uh, DSM-5 and um, to meet the criteria the client must have a current presentation or a history of and you're going to see that I've used some color coding in these slides to help us really pick up on what I believe are the positive changes um, you know a lot of people with AS um, actually do not manifest until they hit their first wall whether that's college or their first relationship or maybe far into their marriage or the first job loss and so I like that they look at the history not just the current functioning but both okay and you must manifest criteria in all four of these areas okay so let's look at those four areas um, there must be persistent deficits in communication and um, let's see Persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts as manifested by the following or by history. Again, we're looking at someone who maybe with incredibly helpful supports at home may have gotten by for a long time. But if you go back into that early childhood history, you're going to see toe walking or you're going to see social impairment issues or uh, language challenges, not necessarily a delay, but difficulties with using language um, and the examples are illustrative but not exhaustive so in other words in the text they're going to give you some examples but it isn't if you don't have these things it doesn't count um, deficits in social and emotional reciprocity ranging from abnormal social approach okay that's a different approach we've talked in the past the black represents what we've talked about in the past and what was in the four the blue represents the changes that are so meaningful to us so it says from abnormal social approach to a failure of normal back and forth conversation so that does compensate for the people who are overly social or overly invasive and that takes us away from that lack of concept okay um, <clears throat> to a reduced sharing of interests emotions or affect to a failure to initiate or respond to social interactions. So what you see is this flow from overly invasive to quiet and, and maybe possibly withdrawn socially. And so that range really illustrates what's happening. Um, you know, today I was able to listen to a, a WNYC uh, interview with Michael First of Columbia University and he talked about previously in our history the early attempts were to try to delineate these gray lines between each facet or a representation of autism and in reality that's just not going to happen because all the manifestations are there it's just a matter of how it's expressed as Tony Atwood says so now he's saying that the new consensus which we would agree and I think this DSM represents is actually a single disorder on a continuum of functional levels okay so you have to have um, going back let me just double check you have to have uh, criteria in all four of these areas so a you have to have something there and some of these are these abnormal social approaches number two deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors all of that was in the last one but I love this change it's not a lack of eye contact it's an abnormality in the use of eye contact big big difference um, we have seen examples of people on the spectrum who can make eye contact but they don't know when to stop making eye contact they kind of stare a hole in you um, people with AS can look at you while you're speaking but have to look away to formulate a thought or vice versa so that normal rhythm of that back and forth with eye contact is, is missing and it's addressed here in a very meaningful way um, uh, let's see and again the deficits could include um, difficulties reading body language or understanding 
okay? Deficits and understanding, and then the use of gestures, all that's the same as the four, okay? Number three is deficits in developing, maintaining and understanding relationships. And again, the maintaining and understanding looks at the longevity of relationships. It's not, can you make a friend, but can you keep a friend? Um, many people with autism so rarely have these really deep relationships that they can burn out a person in a relationship. So being able to figure out how to maintain a relationship and when too much is too much and when not enough is not enough. Um, and then having difficulties adjusting your behavior for different social contexts. Um, and so again, you know, all of this is kind of a nuanced view of what we've known but hasn't been in print before. And then uh, difficulty addressing a different social contexts all the way to the absence of interest in peers, which is what we, you know, we stereotypically thought of autism as representing. This is what, um, one of the things that has disturbed me a little bit because um, when we heard a presentation on this at ASA last year in San Diego, we had been told by Brian King, one of the writers of the DSM, that they had determined that they were going to take severity issues off the page because they're so very subjective. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. And so when we look at the severities page later on, you'll see why that concerns me quite a bit. But the severity is based on social communication impairments and restricted repetitive patterns of behavior. So we'll look at that table two, pieces of that table two later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Section B is restricted repetitive patterns of behavior. Again, we've seen this. This is exactly the same except for this caveat that the examples are illustrative and that it could be historical information maybe not just current information about a person's expression. Uh, stereotypic and repetitive motions, use of objects, all of that's the same. Oh, I forgot to highlight this one. Um, the, la the last two are really critical to Asperger's, echolalia and idiosyncratic phrases. Um, many of us who do speak and, do, and many of us who have Asperger's are actually quite well-spoken. But if you're around us long enough, you notice um, that it, there's a pattern to it. There's a pattern to the rhythm. Um, some of the language doesn't feel contextually accurate. It feels like it's borrowed from somewhere else. Uh, when I was in college, my classmates used to, I'm going to date myself here, used to tell me how um, they thought I reminded them of Carol Burnett. Well, I'm sure I did uh, because I functioned by mimicking her and I I would literally hear people use a phrase and decide to adopt it and try to integrate it into my social language. So that use of idiosyncratic language that can evolve from echolalia or be another highly developed version of it, in my opinion, um, is, is a really key addition to this. Insistence on sameness and flexible adherence to routines, that's new. Um, it's actually part of this ritualized pattern of verbal or nonverbal behavior but it's nuanced down for the people who don't externalize it quite as much. And then this is really wonderful. Extreme distress at small changes, difficulties with transition, rigid thinking patterns, rigid greeting rituals, the need to take the same route. Oh my gosh, how many of you who have been parents have had to take a different route to get somewhere so you wouldn't go past those golden arches? I know we used to do it all the time. Um, and the need to eat the same food every day. And again, um, interestingly enough, in the DSM, there is a new diagnostic category for kids who won't eat. Um, so uh, we'll talk about these little pieces of it that are found throughout the DSM and other categories. Um, this is the same as before, highly restricted fixated interests and uh, unusual objects. Um, excessively circumscribed or preservative interests, again, are all the same. Um, hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input. All mention of sensory in this one is brand new. And so we are very excited about this because in the initial draft, sensory wasn't mentioned. Um, but through aggressive advocacy on the part of the community, I believe, we were able to get it in. And so again, it ranges from an indifference to pain and temperature to um, fascination with your environment. So it's again, that range is there. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and again, we see the severity categories here. We'll talk about <clears throat> C, the last category. No, I think there's a fifth. Um, symptoms must be present in early developmental period. And here's what's great about it, but may not become fully manifest until social demands exceed limited mm -hmm. capacities 
or may be masked by learned strategies later in life. Um, I have had so many adults who I've said, you know, when you go apply for this service or that service, stop pretending to be normal and they've completely lost their authentic identity as a person with autism because of um, social and parental input trying to help them adapt to living in the world and you know the the sad thing about a late diagnosis is you know when you get an early diagnosis quite often parents will manage it a little more effectively where they acknowledge the difference but they teach you strategies but they love the authentic person you are and they help you to grow that person and um, being normal is a, a, a veil you wear uh, as needed um, but when you grow up not knowing you have an autism difference um, the people around you teachers and parents and even employers and siblings may put pressure on you to uh, repress that side of yourself and sometimes that's not emotionally uh, very successful. Um, <clears throat> okay and then section D symptoms cause clinically significant impairment in social occupation or other important areas of current functioning. Well that's great but when you see the page that talks about severities we'll talk about how subjective that really is. Um, and then E, <clears throat> these disturbances are not better explained by intellectual disability, so ID is a separate category by itself, or global developmental delay, which is another subset of that. Intellectual and disability uh, and autism can co-occur, and um, to make a comorbid diagnosis of autism and ID is okay. Um, but um, the social communication should be below that expected for general development. So they're saying that ID and autism can co-occur but doesn't have to. Okay, and then it says specify if. Um, is it with or without ID? Is it with or without a separate language impairment? Um, kids with ASD can have um, a speech impediment, for example, or they can have an expressive or receptive language problem that exceeds what is just inherently part of the condition. Is it combined with a medical or genetic condition? Uh, we'll see that again. Is it associated with another neurodevelopmental, mental, or behavioral disorder? Is it with or without catatonia? So we were hoping that that was going to be the limit to the severities level, but unfortunately that wasn't what happened. Okay. And then there's um, a huge area that's a narrative, and I tried to just capture some really key parts of that, but it is really um, very, very detailed and very contextual, and, and so I really encourage you to try to get a copy of the five, <coughs> the five or possibly even go to, um, go to Barnes and & Noble and, and, you know, ask to see a copy and just sit down and look it through. But... Um, it says, they, they're saying this, but I fear it's not going to happen. These descriptive severity categories should not be used to determine eligible, eligibility for provision of services. These can only be developed at an individual level through discussion of personal priorities and targets. I think that's a fantasy. I think when you put a severities level in a DSM, um, you're going to get eligibility delineations attached, attached to it. So we'll see what happens. Um, but they tried. Uh, separate estimates of verbal and nonverbal skills are necessary, um, and they encourage the use of untied nonverbal tests, which I think is going to be a real asset for people who struggle with communication. Um, I do wish they would have emphasized that the use of nonverbal tests in people with language is sometimes a better way to assess competency. Mm -hmm. um, under the diagnostic features, it includes a clause here that says, the stage at which functional impairment becomes obvious will vary according to the individual and her environment, his or her environment. The core features are evident in the developmental period, but intervention, compensation, and supports may mask difficulties in some contexts. So this is this kind of addresses the young person who's been homeschooled until, you know, they hit high school or until they leave for college. Um, it may be quite possible that until they have to take direction from someone less predictable than their parents. Um, that they may not ever get diagnosed. Uh, continuing under that, um, adults who have developed compensation strategies for some social challenges still struggle in novel or unsupported situations and suffer from the effort and anxiety of consciously calculating what's socially intuitive for most. Um, wow, do I think that's a great phrase. Uh, I think people underestimate the amount of cognitive energy um, that um, 
people who are less obviously disabled are using um, to function. I mean, as I'm talking to you right now, I'm trying to figure out if I've made enough eye contact. I'm trying to make sure I stay mm -hmm. focused on the screen. I'm trying to be aware of my voice and, and the pitch and the volume and the intonation. Mm -hmm. And that's all happening while I'm trying to hold the, the cognitive information in my head that I'm trying to teach at the same time. So it mm -hmm. is very effortful, and I think that was um, a tip of the hat to that effort that we put forth. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of different processes going on at one time. Yeah. I did want to mention that um, Trish Washburn is in the um, chat room. Okay. And she's just said to wish you well, but she is... Um, yeah. Does she have a question? Um, I'm not, I asked if she had one. I don't, not this time, I don't think. Okay, great. But I would definitely be... Uh, I want to mention for people who are watching this for future reference that we do have a chat room that's running. So anyone who has a question during one of our presentations, you're more than welcome to become part of any of these um, autism brainstorm events. Thank you, Dina. Sure. Okay, so what's not right? I mean, it looks pretty good at first glance. It's certainly a significant improvement. Uh, from what we saw in the four, but there's some things missing um, that kind of worry me. Um, and, and that's what the rest of the presentation is going to focus on. Executive function isn't mentioned anywhere in there, at least in that terminology, and there really isn't any reference to it. Interestingly enough, what we would have perceived to be executive function difficulties in ASD are actually in ADHD now. Um, and so we'll and and um, we'll talk about that. There is no mention of difficulty with perspective taking or what we've called theory of mind. Um, there is no reference to the functional manifestations and the ones that are going to be in this this um, um, you know in the chart we're going to show you here in a minute are very subjective. So we'll talk about that. In the front of the DSM for many, many years, there was this one-page document called the GAF, or the Global Assessment of Functioning. And basically, it allowed us to look at a person's functioning level and score it. Um, and um, you know, many of the clients I've worked with with Asperger's, especially those who have experienced repeated personal trauma or employment-based or educational trauma, even though they have higher than average IQs or right at average, their GAF scores are really, really low because of trauma and abuse and neglect and years of not knowing they had this and not understanding how to use accommodations and adaptations to cope with their condition. So it was quite possible for a person with an IQ even in the gifted range in the 120s, 130s, even 140s to have a tragically low GAF score, which allowed us to execute the need to get them social security or extra services. There is no GAF anymore. So I don't know what that means, um, but I'm worried about it. Mm -hmm. um, there's no discussion of the implications I've listed here vulnerabilities due to social impairment and the vulnerability to abuse. Um, mm -hmm. r r the, I th they mentioned sensory, but I don't think it emphasized significantly enough the employment, learning, and relational barrier. I mean, sensory negatively affects sexual relationships and intimacy in ways we haven't even discussed publicly very much. Mm -hmm. um, difficulty with abstract thinking and generalizing. Uh, the rigidity kind of hints to that, but it doesn't really mention it. Um, perfectionism with tendency for rumination and obsession is going to slide over to OCD, I fear. Um, mm -hmm. High incidence of co-occurring LD, global processing speed issues and deficits in working memory that lead to low test scores or low IQ scores. Um, they're, they're actually going to address that and the, okay, I'm going to give you a little hint. You can have everything. You can have mm -hmm. like five diagnoses in this new DSM-5. So right. as we go through it, it'll make sense to you. Right. Now, we do have a question, if you want to take that sure. now. And let me pull up the chat screen very quickly. And Trish asks, um, specifically, how do you think the DSM will help girls on the spectrum? Oh, Trish, hold on. We're going to get there. Um, it's actually <laughs> going to be very cool. Um, and I'll show you where we they address that. Okay. okay. Um, and then they do make reference to that these, well, they don't actually say the difficulties lead to co-occurring mental health and physical health issues, but they acknowledge that they do co-occur. So mm -hmm. that's good. And there's no mention of this, 
this thing we call diagnostically a decompensation. And that is a, a period by which a person is unable to just continue this effortful journey that they experience every day. Um, it, it can co-occur with depression, but basically it's just a physical and cognitive shutdown um, that can la last for quite a long time. And if you've been in the autism community a long time, you've seen this manifest in the fact that persons who have been spokespersons in the community can sort of just disappear for periods of weeks or months. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what's happening. They're trying to either prevent a decompensation or they're coming back from one. Um, so I, I wish they'd address that. So I can't really capture the chart, um, but if you can work with me here, this is kind of what the chart looks like in the book. Um, on the left, there's levels one, two, and three in a category system. And then uh, number one is the severity levels themselves. So the, the levels are requiring substantial support. Um, I'm sorry. See, this is why I did it the way I did it, Kathleen. Okay. Requiring very substantial support. Mm -hmm. Level two is requiring substantial support, and level one is requiring support. Mm. That's pretty abstract. Yes. And then the two categories that follow after that are explanations, where the red X is. We're going to go through each one of these. An explanation of what requiring substantial support looks like and what restricted repetitive behaviors look like in each of the levels. Is that making sense to you, Kathleen? Mm -hmm. Okay, then I know it's making sense to everybody else. Okay. So what's wrong? Well, here's what it says under social communication level three. Severe deficits in verbal and nonverbal communication skills that cause severe impairments in functioning, very limited initiation of social interaction, and minimal response to social overtures from others. I don't know a single person with Asperger's who hasn't experienced that in the right time, in the right place, in the right circumstances. Oops. Okay? And this category is going to be primarily focused toward people who are nonverbal or more evidently disabled. Okay? Um, and minimal response to social overtures. For example, a person with few words of intelligible speech who rarely initiates interaction and when he or she does makes unusual approaches to meet needs only and responds only to very direct social approaches. So, you know, one of my colleagues here has a son who's an adult who's uh, nonverbal, and uh, we were sitting in his group home, and we were getting ready to do some things, and he came over and unplugged the television and took my hand to take me upstairs to listen to his music. Oh. I, I think that's what this is supposed to be representative of, uh, but let me show you what happens when we go to level two. And I, and these, what I've done is I've, honest to God, just transplanted level one into this slide and I've crossed out the words that were unique to level one so you could see that there isn't really much difference. Okay? Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, significant deficits, it's marked deficits in verbal and nonverbal communication. Social impairments are apparent even when supports are in place. So even with an IEP, even with a social coach, even with a peer mentor, the social impairment still manifests. Mm -hmm. um, limited initiation of social interactions is in both. The blue is in one, I'm sorry, three and two. And then it goes from minimal to reduced or abnormal responses to social overtures from others. Not a lot of difference there, is there? And it's very, very subjective. And it doesn't take into consideration that, again, you know, when I go to the airport and I can't pre-board my flight and the person I'm talking to doesn't understand how I can communicate and still need to pre-board, I become pretty severely impacted at that point. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm real nervous about this. Now, when we get to level one, I'm very worried. Without supports in place, deficits in social communication cause noticeable impairments. So does that mean with supports in place, you don't have any deficits in social <laughs> communication? Because mm. I haven't seen that to be the case. Right. 
And then it says difficulty initiating social action interactions and clear examples of atypical or unsuccessful responses to social overtures for others. That's very classic Asperger's. We try to be social, but we don't always have the skill set to be social in a way that's positive. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, may appear to have de decreased interest in social interactions, but is that interest or is that ability? I don't think we can say that. Um, so the person may speak in full sentence and engage in communication, but the back and forth with others may fail, and attempts to make friends are odd and unsuccessful. Okay? Boy, does that underestimate the complexity of the journey that people with Asperger's experience. So I was real happy with the DSM-5. As you know, I pre previewed what I thought it was going to be based on Brian King's input from mm -hmm. the panel. But now that we see the severities level, I am very, very concerned about that piece of it. And here's another thing. The pieces of AS have been put into other categories. So this new category of social communication disorder is what people are really nervous about because it appears that they've taken the pragmatic language difficulties of Asperger's and they've kind of plopped it into its own category. And so if a student has learned to camouflage many of the other facets of this, they might wind up stuck here. And I'm not sure that school services are going to follow this category. We have no idea what schools are going to do with the categories that are here. So again, the same language, persistent difficulties in the social use of verbal and nonverbal communication manifested by all of the following. Deficits in social purposes, greeting, sharing information, social context, impairment in the ability to change communication to match the context. Didn't we just talk about that under ASD? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think this is kind of a tip of the hat to nonverbal learning disorder. Um, difficulties following rules for conversation and storytelling, such as taking turns in conversation, rephrasing when misunderstood, and knowing how to use verbal and nonverbal signals. Aren't we talking about Asperger's here? Difficulties understanding what is not explicitly stated. Here's the theory of mind. Here's the, the issues related to taking perspective and context. But it's not under the ASD label, it's here under this separate category of social pragmatic communication disorder. Uh, B, the deficits result in functional limitations that affect you globally, and the onset of the sy symptoms is in early development but may not become manifest until demands exceed limited capacities. Um, symptoms are not attributable to another condition, um, and here they, they speak about problems with word structure and grammar. That may be environmental or may be a language-based disorder, um, and it says are not better explained by ASD or ID or another mental disorder. So if all you have is a pragmatic language disorder, you can get this diagnosis, but my fear will be that if you have this piece of it, as we've seen before in the four, what we would see is the LD would be prominent or the ADHD component would be prominent or um, maybe the sensory piece would be prominent and we would diagnose one piece of it without digging deeper to see if the rest of the disorder was there. So you can see what's wrong with the severities level. Let's look at the restrictive repetitive behaviors component of it. The level three is inflexibility of behavior, extreme difficulty coping with change or other restricted repetitive behaviors, markedly interfere with functioning in all spheres, great distress and difficulty changing focus or action. Again, I've cut and pasted that into level two. Inflexibility of behavior, not extreme, but just difficulty. Okay, what, how do you measure the difference between extreme and just difficulty coping with change? Okay, other restricted repetitive behaviors, appear frequently enough to be obvious to the casual observer. All right, m my son's sort of a Forrest Gumpy guy. He's not a Big Bang Theory guy. And I can't tell you how many times people have come to me after observing him and said, well, we couldn't even spot him in the room. Well, if a teacher can't spot him, what's a casual observer going to get out of it? Mm -hmm. And then they deleted them markedly and just put may interfere with functioning in a variety of contexts. So not in all spheres, which, you know, says if he does great at home, that's fine. Um, but then it says instead of grade, it just says distress and or difficulty changing focus or action. So these are such subjective terms in mm -hmm. here. And again, 
on any given day under the right circumstances a level one can become a level three right in the moment okay and then level one which is the highest functioning quote unquote people and flexibility of behavior causes significant interference in one or more contexts so they've taken out all the difficulty with change they've taken out the repetitive behaviors that interfere they've taken out all spheres or all environments and they just said one or more contexts okay I'm, I, I just that's un unbelievable and unrealistic to me problems of organization finally some manifestation of executive function but I, I've never met anybody anywhere on the autism spectrum that doesn't have trouble with executive function and organization difficulties hamper with that hamper independence so I, I have grave concerns about this I'm not going to beat this horse you can see it on the slides for yourself that they've just kind of minimized the experience of people with ASD the good news is if you've ever had a diagnosis of um, a well-established DSM-4 diagnosis of autistic disorder Asperger's disorder or PDD or PDD NOS you should be still getting an ASD diagnosis okay so that's good news all right um, and but here's where they take it back individuals who have marked deficits in social communication but whose symptoms do not meet the criteria for ASD should be evaluated for social pragmatic communication disorder there is no way to evaluate for that really we don't have an ADOS for social pragmatic communication disorder yet here's your uh, question answered about gender um, again in this narrative piece at the end it says in clinic samples females tend to be likely to show accompanying ID suggesting that girls without accompanying intellectual disabilities or language delays may go unrecognized so they're not saying they're the first sentence says that it's a four to one ratio but then they say the qualifier here which I'm excited about if you don't have an intellectual impairment or a language delay you may go unrecognized because of subtler manifestations of social communication difficulties I think that's really really good um, I do wish it was some way it was more emphasized it's just buried in paragraphs of these kind of little tips and tidbits of information um, differential diagnosis okay um, this is a big change from the four it says a diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder should be considered when attentional difficulties or hyperactivity exceeds that typically seen in individuals of comparable age when criteria for both ADHD and ASD are met both diagnoses should be given so a lot of people were doing that under the four a lot of professionals but it was you know one ruled out the other um, so now they're saying yeah you can have both and you're going to see that you can have both of a lot of different things okay mm -hmm. uh, under court comorbidity they said that ADHD is often comorbid um, they put these two stats in there but they don't clarify where they came from they said up to 70 percent of people who have an autism spectrum disorder have one comorbid mental disorder so depression or anxiety or something like that Dana, um, can I ask you a real quick question sure. if I don't throw you off with this comorbid one mental disorder um, are they are they specifying there is, is anybody giving any hypotheses of where it's coming from if it's a um, no. okay not, if, it's, if, it's, if it's drug induced if it's environmental due to the other communication challenges that brings these on or if it's something that's in the neurological wiring we really don't know I can okay. tell you anecdotally out of my private practice mm -hmm. that a lot of the comorbid mental disorder issues I've seen in my adult clients it's manifested from years and years of neglecting the condition mm -hmm. um, either intentionally or unintentionally on the part right. of um, the community as a whole whether you want to call that teachers or parents or whatever mm -hmm. um, but I'm also saying that you know I, I'm seeing in my adults that once you sit down with them Mm -hmm. and you fully explain to them what it is and you help them to, to uh, pull out how they personally experience the condition and, mm -hmm. and I, you know I call this like late intervention you know and we talk about the benefits of early intervention but you know this kind of intensive intervention to help them get their head around this is just mm -hmm. as valuable at 40 as it is at 4 oh definitely um, 
Yeah. And, and so what I'm finding is once we help them get to that place where they understand that, mm -hmm. then we start seeing a lifting of anxiety. And then when the anxiety lifts, the depression lifts. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, and then the other thing we have to talk about, um, you know, I've spoken previously on, on Brainstorm that, you know, my first misdiagnosis was depression. I probably had it, but it wasn't in isolation like that. Mm -hmm. The second diagnosis I got, which nearly killed me, was bipolar disorder. And they yeah. hit me on like 10 different psychiatric drugs at once. I was very uh, disabled by the medication and the misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that goes back to your idea of environment and toxicity. Mm -hmm. Is it that the mental disorder is being brought on by being mm -hmm. treated with, say, a stimulant that makes you not sleep at night, which right. catapults you into being unable to function during the day and enhances your anxiety? Mm -hmm. I would love to have known where that number came from, but there's no footnote mm -hmm. that we don't know. Okay. Um, then they go on to say 40% have two or more. Um, they have another new category of disability called developmental coordination disorder. So mm -hmm. if you go back to the original criteria, you notice the fine motor skills, the using of scissors, the riding of bikes for large motor, the toe walking, none of that is mentioned under ASD anymore. It's its own separate condition. I have, I, and I, so I guess it's because you can have those motor delays without having autism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, based on this, I mean, in my worst of worst days, I would have been probably described as multiply handicapped if I were mm -hmm. in school, um, because I would have been given a diagnosis of ADHD and developmental coordination disorder, which is really low muscle tone, and anxiety disorder, and difficulties with sleep, and specific learning disability in math. I mean, oh my gosh, talk about making people look profoundly disabled mm -hmm. in, in a way that may not be proactive. I mean, it, it's just it, the, it, the give and take, the back and forth between mm -hmm. not too disabled to very disabled. I mean, it's it's confusing and bewildering. It seems like it really will depend on, on the implementation of the supports that are given. Absolutely. I can see how it could be incredibly proactive. I, I do, too. I think Overall, I think it's going to be good. The implementation is going to be the big question that we can't anticipate. Well, uh, as long as the emphasis is on the abilities rather than the supports. And the supports well, are very important, but the, the, the focus on abilities will definitely drive the way that um, any support structures are implemented, I'm sure. Right, right. And then they have comorbidity under medical. So under mm. other medical conditions, they have epilepsy, sleep, constipation, again, this ACD disorder. Avoidant restrictive food intake disorder is another separate category all in and of itself. So what worries me is that some parents are going to look at the ASD criteria, but also see in their child an ACD and, and now this ADHD and all these other pieces. The pieces aren't all in one neat pile anymore. Mm -hmm. So they may only be working on one piece of their child's condition instead of seeing it more globally. Um, so I don't know. I have, I, I have my anxieties about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of it for me today. I mean, this is not intended um, to be definitive. It's not mm -hmm. intended to be more than just my personal interpretation. I'm hoping what it is is just simply a community dialogue um, mm -hmm. that we can get started. But I, I think that anybody looking at this, as I've highlighted the blue areas that are there that were not there in the four, I think anybody would look at it and say, it's not perfect, but it's better. Uh, I, I mean, from my point of view, you know, I, I put on Facebook, I'm still autistic, how about you? You know, <laughs> um, because I still see those. I have grave concerns that um, what started as an important piece, which was mm -hmm. putting all of the autisms in one category with the intention of ensuring that school systems and insurance companies could no longer say, you don't have autism, you have Asperger's. I, I think that was what their intent was, but boy, as soon as they put that severities page in, that mild, moderate, severe came back to haunt us, and I'm really worried about the implications of that. Um, mm. It'll be interesting, too, to see if the whole DSM-5 goes right out the window. You know, if the psychological community says, we're not going to use it, and they go to the ICD-10 and then later to the 11, we mm. may have just wasted a lot of good time here. Um, mm -hmm. 
but you know it's going to be a really significant year this year in terms of diagnostics and understanding ASD and uh, we really don't know what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen, do you have any more questions or do you have any questions? I don't see any from the chat room at this time. Mike, I, my concern is this. I, I, hear, I hear your concern about um, abandoning a tool that might have been very, very helpful. I have no but problems I, abandoning the four. <laughs> uh -huh. But I do think it sounds to me, from a layperson's perspective, but someone who's very, very interested in supporting people on and off and around the spectrum, that it sounds as though we're moving more towards a symptoms-based approach rather than looking at labels. And I think that's a very positive intention. Well, you know, I, uh, I have several colleagues that are across the big water, as they say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at some of the models in Europe, uh, bypassing France, that's another mm -hmm. topic for another day. Um, well, yeah. They really do um, serve the child based on their need mm -hmm. rather than their label. And I yes. think until we really fully engage in that process, um, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I understand that the DSM is supposed to identify the deficits. That's mm -hmm. the job, um, primarily for data collection purposes and for reimbursement, mm -hmm. um, insurance reimbursement. However, right. I do wish that they had said anything about some of the gifts of autism, you know, mm -hmm. that in spite of these deficits with proper supports, here's what we can expect them to accomplish. Um, uh, that's that's very very tricky to do as well because yeah. the the un the uneven development and it's a it's a morphing thing from person to person. One person's profile is so completely different. is unique. It's truly unique. Absolutely. And you everyone know. has these gifts, but it's very difficult to say. You know, <laughs> it's such a movable target. I guess. Well, here's what I think is not movable. Mm -hmm. And this is how I've approached this in explaining autism to my daughter when she was very young and trying to help her understand her brother. And, and this is how I perceive it when I work with my son. You know, every semester that he stays in college is a, a gosh darn miracle. You yes. know, mm -hmm. He's, he, he is not the kid that I would have ever dreamed uh, mm -hmm. would be succeeding at college. But boy, he's in services, direct one-on-one -on -one support to achieve that goal over 40 hours a week. So I don't worry about whether he can maintain a job because he's already doing that functionally mm -hmm. at school right now. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, um, you know, this is the only place in the country he could probably have that level of support and be that, you know, su uh, successful. Right. Um, and I'm looking at going back and getting my doctorate. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to look at one thing and, that, and this is what, what we have to focus on. We want every person to get the supports they need to achieve their individual personal best. Yes. And that's very uniquely defined mm -hmm. from person to person. Um, my daughter graduated from getting her master's, never paid a dime in tuition because she works at the university. She mm -hmm. was an A, occasionally a B student, but mm -hmm. you know, that's her personal best. That's what we should expect from her. Every time my son gets an A, we shoot off fireworks. You know, because <laughs> his personal best and you know there's always one class we're sweating that's going to come in as a D um, mm -hmm. you know but you know what he never stops trying and he never asks to not be here and we offer him that option um, mm -hmm. and so I, I understand that you can't measure it it's not concrete mm -hmm. but you know what we do know is that with meaningful supports anxiety yes. diminishes mm -hmm. depression diminishes and if they have personal and emotional wellness then they can mm -hmm. achieve their personal best, whatever right. that's defined as. Um, so and you're I, so I right. Being, being acknowledged for, the, for their abilities and for their successes is every bit as important, I think, as the supports to the challenges. Yeah, and there was no mention of that. There was no mm -hmm. mention of, you know, the need for validation for these kids. Right, right, No absolutely. mention of the need for reinforcing uh, successes. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it's funny, a friend of mine's trying to get those kind of supports for her kids and kid in the classroom. She's just saying, can you just tell him he did a good job a couple of times a day? And they're like, <laughs> Should we have to do that? That's, that's um, the very bottom totem. Bottom of the pole. Bottom well, you know, this is what this kid lives for, is for a teacher to say, good job. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I don't think it's perfect. 
I think like everything else we've ever done in the autism community, there's so many things we put on paper, or so many things that are studied, um, and there's just the real life application of that information. And so, you know, I do think going forward that it's still going to be up to people like you and me, Brian King, Stephen Short, John Robeson. The whole it's, community. The whole it's community. going to be up to the community to fill yeah. in the gaps, as it's always been. Um, but mm -hmm. overall, if I had to choose between the four or the five, hands down, the five is massively, massively better. If we could just okay. read out those severities pages, I'd be a happy girl. <laughs> um, so, so that's it. Um, well, thank I tell you, you so much. Thank you. And you did help very much clarify the changes in the DSM to the DSM-4 to the DSM-5. And this has been Dina Gasner, and you can find her at dinagasner.com and c4ucontact at gmail.com. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Dina. I appreciate your, your time and your expertise. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>